Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, I'm going to be chatting with a real life friend of mine, mother of 10, homeschooler since her oldest was, you know, starting school, Julie Craigie. They have a channel called the Craigie Family or Jason and Julie, I think they call it now. And she also has a homeschool website. She has really taken a lot of moms under her wing in teaching them new mothers who are wanting to homeschool about homeschooling or just to encourage moms who are in the thick of it. I like her approach because it feels doable. She's a mom who has done it. She's had every age all the way from she still has a young baby up to kids who are in high school. And so we can always learn from somebody in that position and she's done a beautiful job of it. She also has a homestead, so she fits right in here with the Simple Farmhouse Life crowd. I can't believe I haven't gotten her on yet, but obviously she's busy, so let's dive in. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Hey, Julie, thank you so much for joining me. I was just doing a little introduction and saying, like, I'm bringing on my real life friend this time to talk about homeschool. I have on a a lot of people I haven't actually met in real life. I mean, we feel like friends afterwards, but Julie is actually local to me. They are the family that whenever I shared on my YouTube channel and on here that our cow is about to have a calf, they, which, or no, she had a calf. We didn't know she was. And uh, they came over and helped us build a milk stanchion, like right that day so we could milk her. So, yep. Yes. (laughs) We know all about trying to scramble and do things when they need to be done instead of planning ahead. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because life happens. Yeah, they do. It does. And, you know, she just had her second calf. And so now we are getting like crazy amounts of milk. I just did my first, hopefully what turns out to be like a hard cheese wheel today, which I've been wanting to do forever. And Ooh, that's exciting. I guess we're in t- we're we're doing it now. We're going to attempt. <laughs> nice. I've never tried that before. Well, I'll let you know how it goes. Once you get it mastered, then I'll have to come and take lessons. Yeah. I it it was a lot this morning because I had no clue what I was doing, but it's one of those things where like once you've done it five or six times, it's not going to really like I could just do it while going about my regular day like I can mozzarella, sourdough, like all the other those types of things, but yeah, I had to follow like every direction to the letter this time because I'm not sure where I can skim, right. but I'll figure that out eventually. Yep, you'll get there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's start with introductions. Tell us about you, your family, your homeschooling journey, your homeschooling website. Yes. Okay. So I am Julie and I have 10 kids. Uh, my youngest is two months old and then they go up to 16 years old. And we actually, I guess about six years ago or so, we moved out into the country. So we lived in St. Louis City, and we just wanted room for our kids to run. And so we moved to the country, and since then we have slowly built up a little homestead because, you know, we just want to be able to provide for our family as much as possible. And so that's kind of been our goal. I was homeschooled halfway through. I went to public school through, um, I guess I was eighth grade when my mom pulled us out of school and then homeschooled through high school and went on to university. And I knew having those two experiences, I knew that I wanted homeschool and my husband was on board with it. So right off the bat, we jumped into homeschooling. And I think probably the hardest part of homeschooling was that beginning when I felt like, oh, I just have a baby and I just have a toddler and I want to start homeschooling, you know, without realizing that homeschooling is such a a way of life. It's just part of how you live. And I, I wanted to start something official. So here I am now, you know, a decade into it or more, depending on when you consider that we began. And yeah, you just, as you go along, you refine more and more of what works for you. And so part of my passion is being able to encourage other women, because I feel like there is, um, just like you're talking about with your cheese wheel, when you try something out for the first time, it is so helpful to have somebody say, you're okay, you can do this. And if you feel like I felt led to more of a delight directed learning approach with my kids, but it's scary to walk into something new. And so when you have somebody else saying, you know, I've, I have done this and you can do it too. It's just 
that can be the small thing that you need to kind of push you forward. And so um, I have a website that I have started putting together. Um, it's, you know, it, it hasn't, it's growing. We'll just say it's growing. Um, and it's the delightfulhomeschool.com. And then we also have a YouTube channel, which is how Lisa and I first met, actually. Mm -hmm. And that just um, shows our family dynamics. We live in a really small house. We were in a 575-square-foot house for five years, and we've just added on a bedroom. So we feel like we live in a mansion now. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> we share that um, that family story on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay. You talk a lot about delight-directed learning, and without knowing exactly what that means. I think my first impression is maybe it's sort of like unschooling, but maybe more directed. So could you explain what exactly that means? And then also how this has changed for you over the years? Like, is this how you've always done it? Or is this something that after lots of years of trying a lot of things, this is what seemed to be the most effective? You know, it really started with my own homeschooling journey. So because I was the oldest when my mom pulled us out of school, she had pulled us out for health reasons. And so right off the bat, we started with kind of a scramble because she was focused on getting her kids healthy and not so much on, you know, what kind of curriculum are we going to use? And so I stumbled into a more unschooled type of high school education. So I have that background and it gave me a lot of confidence mm -hmm going forward um, with my own kids, because I saw that even being unschooled, mostly through high school, I was able to walk into adulthood successfully, go to a university, graduate with honors, like all of those things that our culture kind of puts emphasis on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it worked for me. Right. So whenever I had my own kids, of course, in your enthusiasm, I think as a new homeschooling mom, you want to buy curriculum and do all of those kind of official sorts of things. And so I did heavily go that route for a while. But what I saw was that all of my children are very, very different from one another. And mm -hmm. so just handing them one prepackaged deal was doing them a disservice because God made each one of them so unique. And some of them would thrive with one thing and it would be terrible for the other one. And also the more time that we spent just trying to do academics, it took away from the time that they had to pursue those passions that God has put within them. And so more and more, I, I as the years went by, I, I guess I got more courageous to start removing things. So, you know, do we really need to do that? Do we really need to do this? And slowly I started removing things from what we, what I felt like we needed to do in a day. And I got to the place that I am now. So when I say delight-directed learning, um, the reason that I feel that it's different from unschooling is because there is still a lot of direction. It is a partnership between my child and I to decide what would be the best course of education for you. And so, if, you know, I'm not a pro in unschooling because, you know, I know that there's a lot of people with big opinions on on terminologies. And right, so I don't right, want to... Yeah step on any toes. But to yeah. me, unschooling is a little bit more loose. There isn't direction. It's just kind of day to day, you know, following what you want to do that day. Whereas we have more direction. We do have daily requirements, but the emphasis is on let's tailor this education to you as a, as an individual. Right. Yeah. And I see that really start to be more apparent. Like you said, you were homeschooled through high school. And so presumably you already knew how to read, how to write, how to do math. You know, you could do a lot of these basic things. And at that stage, there are so many different directions that kids will go based on their interests. And I, I see that a little younger than high school, but I do find, okay, I have to get out of the way The you know, you have to learn how to properly and, you know, read really well. You have to learn how to write. You have to learn how to do basic math. And then once my once my kids are around like ages seven to ten, I start to see all of these different interests. So my oldest, which you know, Ruth, she doesn't really care about being in the kitchen with me. She doesn't care about learning how to do sourdough, how to make cheese, how to like all the things that I just love learning. She doesn't, but she's interested in more artistic things like she loves She's in a filmmaking course right now, and she has projects going at all times, whether it's filming or whether it's making patterns. She has ideas like, I'm going to make design these patterns to sell. And then she she makes the patterns, and we never get to the stage of actually 
selling them. But she's always <laughs> always has a project. And then your oldest, she's really into animals. She, you know, she took over the rabbit breeding and the dairy cow, all of that stuff. You can just see the way these interests blossom. And yeah, there does become a point where you're trying something, you're beating your head against the wall on a certain something. Like, for example, <laughs> one of my kids and I, we butt heads on certain math things. And once she's mm-hmm. past the basics, I'm over here like going through a cheese course, learning how to make cheese. She wants no- to do nothing else except for come over there and learn that too. I'm like, you know what? Right. Put away the math for the day. Like, why are we forcing yeah. that whenever you're interested in mm-hmm. wanting to jump in with me and learn this? It's really this societal pressure that you have to learn X, Y, Z. And then you think about it and you're like, but why? Yeah. I don't use that at all. And I do so many things, you know? Yes, it really is getting over How that. do you gain that confidence? Um, you know, this is why I think I have an advantage to a lot of people because I, being a second generation homeschooler, I was able to see that my high school education, most people would say was lacking when it came to, you know, I, I didn't even make it through an algebra book. That was like the most schooly thing that we did through all of my high school years. And there was really no structure. I read a lot. I was interested in writing. So I would just write for fun. So in spite of that, I was able to move on and throw myself passionately into what came next and learn as I went. So my learning didn't stop whenever I, you know, turned 18 and graduated mm-hmm. or whatever age you decide yeah. that to be your learning is a lifelong process. And so it's given me the courage to say, I don't need to get hung up on making sure that my kids know everything that they need to know, which is impossible anyway, uh, by the time they graduate from our, from our homeschool. It's just, I think it's more of just a crutch for parents to feel like they are raising their children well. But Mm -hmm. if we really step back and we look at the big picture, we say, what does this child need to know to be successful in what they are going to do in the future? And, yes, right. You know, like my oldest daughter, for example, she is passionate about starting her own business, having a homestead, but also the business that she wants to do. She's not going to need to know calculus. It's completely irrelevant right. to what exactly. she wants to do in her life. So I'm not mm-hmm. concerned with having her go through an upper level math course of any kind because it, in some ways, it would be a waste of time for her. It would. What she needs is business <laughs> math and yeah. um, practical application of things that mm-hmm. she's actually going to use. And so instead of spending those precious high school years having kids learn a bunch of things that will be irrelevant to their future, let's equip them for what they want to do. So my second son, uh, he's completely different than his sister. He mm-hmm. enjoys having the structure of you know, curriculum or academics. He He's learning Latin because he enjoys it. Right, right. Um, he's planning to go into computers. It's just a completely, completely different person. Yeah. And so I am helping him to come alongside of him and say, okay, well, here's what you want to do with your life. What would best help you with that? Yeah. And let's spend your time studying those things. Yeah. And the key with both of those situations is neither kid just wanted to like, okay, I feel delighted today in watching TV all day and playing video games. Neither of them wanted to do that. Both of them just wanted the tools they needed for the passions that they are excited about. And what I noticed more than anything else, that's very different. And I can't say that I know all kids. So I'm sure it's, there are kids in all different situations that are like this, but okay. I can say more than me when I was a kid, They are so interested in so many things and so excited about like real life stuff and actually put forth the effort to learn it because they still are excited about learning. And that's where I'm like, okay, we're, we're doing something right. I will give you the tools. I will buy you the filmmaking course. We'll buy all the cheese supplies. We'll sit down and we'll learn how to make, I don't know, Johanna has a list of mile long of things she likes to do in the kitchen. She's mostly just interested there. But to me, that, that is school. And I, it's so weird whenever you have to feel like, okay, we should have put another hour in today to math instead of Mm -hmm. learning Mm -hmm. this skill that most people don't even have a clue, like any component of this process. 
like not even a small portion of it, you know, just right, knowing right. how to do stuff. Yeah, it's so true. And, you know, part of the success for doing delight directed learning in your home is having boundaries. And so we do have boundaries when it comes to things like screen time, um, because, you know, kids are are still kids and right. there are some personality types that within my own home that I think would just sit and play video games all day if I would allow that. And it eliminates that opportunity for them to creatively discover the passions that they have. Because, you know, we know that technology can be so mind numbing and addicting. And so um, within our home, we've put up boundaries of, you know, this is when you're allowed to be on this. We keep all of our devices locked, which I think is, we tell kids, it's not that we don't trust you. It's just that part of our role as your parent is uh, keeping you safe. And so we're putting up boundaries that help you to stay accountable. And so these kind of things have enabled our kids to use technology for good, because obviously we do, but also to only use it for those things that are productive and to not allow it to be something that can become an addiction or become just a suck on their time that they could be using for something else. And so we've tried to just kind of draw Mm -hmm. that line. Kids sometimes need a hard line. Yeah. I think that's important to mention. I think that's where people, when they first have unschooling explained to them, if it's, if the boundary piece is left out, I can see how a lot of us are like, wait a minute though. Like (laughs) these kids are just going to, and, mm-hmm. and, and I do have some kids whose personalities do need to be directed a little bit more. I have some who their interests are very clear and some who it takes a little bit more digging to figure out. And also their interests probably would be yeah, watching TV all day. But whenever I do find that, like, especially right now, the screen issue is not even a thing. It, it, it is whenever the weather is really bad or, mm-hmm. you know, there's not a lot of excuse to go or reason to go outside, but like. Whenever it's the weather and how it's been lately, there's that's not even a thing that comes up screens like very yep. rarely. And it's so rarely that it's like, sure, go right ahead. It's I don't care. Right. It's so I think rare. it's our Missouri winters that is when it's kind of hard when kids are inside and they don't want to go out. That's when it seems to be more of a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. But definitely with the boundaries. And then I'm also just a huge advocate for getting the tools. It doesn't have to be expensive. So if you're if your child's interested in a mm-hmm. hobby that's expensive well, then maybe you could just, I don't really know, I guess without specific examples, but there are a lot of resources on YouTube. If you sit down and learn with them, you can you know make sure that you're vetting the sources and making sure that it's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of learning that can be done alongside your kids, giving them the tools that they need to, to pursue whatever passion it is that they have. And it might not be what you're interested in. And I also find that kids after a certain age, they're pretty capable If you're not interested, that's fine. You don't necessarily have to learn it alongside with them. You can just get them the things they need to learn. Oh, yeah, absolutely. My my teens' passions, their knowledge in that area has already exceeded mine. I'm I'm okay with that because that is what God has put in them to do, not in me. And so just equipping them, getting the tools that they need, or um, some of them, you know, they might have interests that surpass our budget. And so... It's helping them to then brainstorm, okay, how can I make this happen? So maybe it is, you know, funding it in some way by using their skills to earn money to then fund what they want to do next or, you know, whatever that may be. We're preparing them for adulthood. That is the goal here. It's not just to have this isolated high school experience and that then, you know, like good luck on adulthood, but we're walking them, we're baby stepping them into what adulthood is like. Yeah. It's weird the disconnect with that. And I I think we forget as parents, especially because of the way things are set up today, to actually do that, to step back and say, what is the goal of this? What are we trying to accomplish here? And then when you really think about it, does this fit into that? And there are so many times whenever I approach that with that question where I'm like, no, this doesn't. This is just what you do. That's all. That's the only reason I'm even doing some of some of the things that yeah. we do is because this is what is expected. It doesn't it does not put them toward the goal of who I can see they as a person are going to be and what they're going to need in their adult life, which is so interesting that we would waste time where these brilliant minds cuz you know kids 
kids are just so capable of learning so many things, but just forcing them to do things. And there, there is a certain level of things that are hard to do. Like even learning to read for some kids is very difficult. Sure. And so, sure, yeah, sure. that's going to happen. But like at a certain point, it's like, uh, why, why calculus? Like you said, like, wh- what is this child going to be an engineer? Yeah. And as you, as their parent, you can tell, you know, whether or not they're going to go into that field. And if they're not, <laughs> why, you know? Right. Why? Yeah. There could be a lot of motivations, but at the heart of it, I think it's trying to identify, is this making me feel good as a parent? Because I can say my child is doing this, this, and this. That's not really a good reason to lead people through um, or to, to lead our kids through something that our motivation should be what's best for them. And, you know, absolutely. I think that as much as I've been talking about the delight directed portion of things, there also is that uh, we do hard things part of our day. And so my kids Mm -hmm. in our home, every home looks different, but in our home, they have to do some type of math. Uh, Most of my kids are going through teaching textbooks, so they'll do one math lesson. Yeah. Or, you know, for my oldest who, like I said, is more with, I feel like she needs equipped in things like business math and, and, you know, that kind of basic math practice, then she'll do a portion of that or, you know, that, that would be a daily requirement. Um, Everybody has to do something for language arts. I just want you to better yourself. So, you know, each of my kids, again, I've talked through what does that look like for you, but the reading and the writing and the arithmetic, like they say, are, are these tools that if we continue to practice those, it doesn't have to be, you know, extreme in the advancement, but if we continue to practice those, that will help to aid them in their interests. And so we, we do those things daily. And then there is lots of time and space for them to explore their interests, which, you know, they're, I feel like the sweet spot for seeing kids' interests come out is usually, with my experience, has been somewhere around age 12. It's like getting ready to go into those um, teen yeah. years is when you really start to see, oh, wow, you're you're really good at that or you're really interested in that. That kind of – you can you can see them come alive when they yeah. get talking about a certain thing. It seems to happen around that age. So before that age – um, because I have a lot, a lot of kids before twelve currently. Yeah, you know the the things that we do initially, they are with me every day because we are learning those skills of reading. That's like the big one here. Because if you can read, you can learn things. Yeah, and so that you know that's a daily thing. They're really with me, which would probably resemble a lot more of what people think of with homeschooling. It's right. Like, let's mm-hmm. sit down. Let's go through this together. We do a subject, a family subject together as if uh, with most of my kids, once my kids are, are higher up in the teen ages, then they're pretty much totally independent on their own. But um, yeah. for all of the rest of my kids, we'll sit together and we'll do a family subject each day. And so we'll just kind of explore something. We might be reading about a time in history or science. You know, those are the types of things that we will do together. And then they're responsible for their independent work, which would be their math and their language arts. And then they have time for pursuing those interests or just, you know, playing Legos or going outside and building a fort. I mean, those are all valid things, especially with those middle and younger kids. You know, just learning who I am in this world is just as important to me as learning reading and writing and and how to add and subtract. Yeah, yeah. I want to take a break from this episode to tell you about today's sponsor, Carly Jean Los Angeles. Carly Jean Los Angeles is an LA-based capsule clothing company started by Carly Brannon, a mom of four who wanted to simplify the way that women get dressed. I've actually had an opportunity to meet Carly in real life, which was amazing. And she's just a genuine mom who wanted to start this clothing company. And then I think it probably blew up beyond her wildest expectations. She is a hardworking woman, but I am currently wearing one of my favorite pieces from her or from the basics line, which is this, what do they call it? They call it a kimono or a cardigan. It goes with everything. I have it in gray, black, and now this tannish pink. I like it because whenever I'm wearing jeans, it will cover up things that I want it to cover up. It works through all seasons of life. I also went through and ordered a few pieces for my spring and summer wardrobe. Now it's finally going to be getting really warm here. It was warm, then it got cold, and now it's warm again. And I have this beautifully curated closet full of things, like a very basic minimal wardrobe that I can get ready very quickly on each day. 
and I cannot wait to wear it because it's just been so chilly and now it's gonna be warm and I can wear all these beautiful Carly Jean things. I also do have all my Carly Jean jeans and long sleeves, so I can wear that too, but I prefer these summer dresses. I cannot wait to get in those. CJLA clothing is classic, timeless, and is meant to be lived in. It's not pieces that are just worn for one or two occasions and never worn again. All the pieces that I've ever sourced from Carly Jean are staples in my wardrobe. I wear them all the time through all different seasons of life, nursing, pregnancy, not doing either of those things. I love their clothes. All CJLA basics are made right here in the US. And so I love supporting those small US companies. Shopping a capsule wardrobe will save you money because you're intentionally choosing pieces that you know you will wear on repeat in multiple ways rather than just one piece for a specific occasion. And for me, with such low amount of space in our house, we don't have closets, that is a must for me to be able to have this collection of clothing that I can wear for everything. All right, Carly Jean is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 20% off the entire site. This is a one-time use code by using the code FARMHOUSE20. So head to carlyjeanlosangeles.com and use the code FARMHOUSE20. And so for you, I get, I get this question a lot and I actually, I, I pulled the audience and had a lot of questions come through. And of course, the biggest question that always comes up with homeschool is how do you do all these multiple ages? And I think what you're saying is before they can read, write, and do math independently, those are the kids that you take under your wing. And then kids beyond that, they might need some direction from you. But at this point, the goal was to produce independent kids who know how to explore whatever interest it is that you've seen that they're going to probably need in their adulthood. You've taught them the foundation of reading, writing, math, and then they mostly can direct themselves, which is in itself a very valuable tool. So to answer the question, I mean, I'm assuming it's you're not doing. I, I know that we we have a really hard time taking our brain out of the traditional system and then thinking of you mm -hmm. as a teacher of 10 different grades, right? which is not at all how homeschool would look. Mm -mm. No, but it's hard. You know, when you aren't living something out for yourself, I think there is a level of curiosity of, you know, what does this look like? And, and it is that curiosity that got us initially started with um, having a YouTube channel, it's just being able to share life in that way. It has been a huge blessing to be able to find community there with people that we may not even ever meet face to face, but there's so many people who are just like you and I, that they are moms trying to do the best for their kids and figuring out as we go along. And so for somebody coming into homeschooling initially, I, I would just encourage you to set down any fears that you have because you don't have to have it all figured out at all. You can just continue to grow in the way that you mm -hmm. do things just as your kids are growing. They're learning and you're learning simultaneously. It does not need to be this polished, you know, here it is day one, we're beginning our first day of school and everything is perfect. And this is exactly how we're going to do things until summer break. I mean, that's just, it, it's unnecessary. And um, it, actually for us, we don't even follow a typical uh, school calendar as you would you know, as most schools do, because we have gotten to the point where learning is part of life. It's integrated right. in our life. And even whether or not my kids are doing math that day, you know, there's certain days that I require those subjects, but not seven days a week, but whether or not they're learning and you don't, it, it takes a pressure off of feeling like you have to accomplish a certain amount of things by a certain you know, predetermined time. Mm -hmm. I actually talked to a woman recently who was saying, um, you know, we're just rushing because I can, I can see, I looked at our calendar and we're already behind of where we need to be before summer comes. And yeah. I just said to her, you know, who makes the rules here? You make the rules. Yeah. There is no behind. <laughs> yeah. There's only forward. There's no falling behind. And there's no reason to feel like you have to finish a, a math book or finish a, a certain curriculum or accomplish a certain number of things before a certain date because you make the rules. And the only goal here is that your children are going forward in their learning and not backwards. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter when that happens. There is no specific start and stop time because this is the rest of their life. We want right. to create kids who become adults that are learners forever <laughs> the rest right. of their life. It's not 
There's, it just completely takes the pressure off. Yeah. When you put it that way, if you are creating kids who are going to be learners for the rest of their life, because not everybody is like, we want to say, oh yeah, you know, humans, everybody learns. I think everybody's meant to, but I don't think everybody does that. I think at some point, you know, we get just overwhelmed or lazy and those times also happen in life. But if you are able to create this culture of learning is something that we do, it's what makes life exciting, it's what makes, you know, just always learning something new is something that we pursue. If they're behind at 17 and who even knows what that means, they're going to be ahead eventually because they have, you know, 75, 80, 90 years to learn stuff. Whereas a lot of us, because of the way this, the whole system is modeled, we don't keep going. And so, you know, they're, I mean, in a way yeah. you don't have to worry about this predetermined time. I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to be 18 and I don't know, I guess you just have to think of that too. Like what's going to happen if we don't finish these worksheets by May 30th? Like what then happens? Yeah, it's really just um, we're imprisoning ourselves when we view learning in that way. Uh, we're putting so much pressure on ourselves that we can get burnt out. And that's a question that a lot of moms will ask me is how do you keep from getting burnt out? Well, I would say adjust your perspective. Because you're living your life too. I tell that to my kids a lot. It's like, you know what? I'm living my life too, right alongside of you. And I want to enjoy this. Right. And I want you I to enjoy it. I got my own interest too. Yeah. And um, uh -huh. let's just enjoy this together. And so if we're feeling burnt out as a mom, it could be because we're putting restrictions or um, expectations on ourselves and our kids that don't need to be there. We we hold the keys. I've I've looked at um, just kind of an overview of homeschooling laws, state to state, and they they really we have a lot of freedom. There, I haven't found a state yet that mm -hmm. is so restrictive that you have to fill in the blank. You know, it's just there's a lot of leeway within the the homeschooling laws that are there, and so then it means that we are putting those burdens on ourselves. It's not somebody else putting them on us. Yeah. It's, it's us doing that. And so, you know, I would challenge you to take a week off and set everything aside and talk to yourself, talk to your kids, talk to your spouse, talk to God and say, you know, what, what's going on here? Why do I feel so burnt out that I just don't want to keep going? Um, what can I bring into my life that brings more delight? You know, you are the lead learner for your kids. So mm -hmm. if you're modeling learning and being excited about learning, then they're going to catch that vision yeah. for themselves. If they see you just burnt out and not enjoying life, unfortunately, that's also contagious. So make sure that you are enjoying the life that you're building for your family. Um, I was so challenged a couple of years ago. Um, I read, I guess it was like a devotional, but it talked about um, that mothers are the gatekeepers for the home of what comes in and the attitude that is set in the home. And it really challenged me because I often would fall into the trap of wanting to say, well, everybody's crabby today and so I can't have a good day or, you know, well, they're all in a bad mood, so I have to be in a bad mood too. And I just wanted to be a victim to falling into that. But the fact is that if I'm the gatekeeper, then I'm the one who can still choose to bring joy into the home, even if everybody else is having a bad day. And it's, you know, it's kind of a hard challenge because it, it's easier to just kind of go along with the bad mood than to just say, you know uh -huh. what, yeah. I'm going to help turn things around here. Uh, maybe we need to just completely stop everything we're doing right now, pull out a really good read aloud book and a snack. And just allow this day, this mood to shift and this day to turn around. It's just making a choice of what do I want my home to be like? Yeah, I I completely agree. And it is easier to fall into that trap. And I've done it way too many times and I know I'll do it again. But it's always good to have that reminder because it is so apparent that you have the control. And I find that with my husband and I too, if one of us is in a bad mood, we can. the other one can carry us and vice versa. But if we both 
go down. <laughs> it's oh, bad. look out. <laughs> yeah, look, look out. out. Oh, man. So, yeah, it, it for sure... It for sure has a contagious effect. And you were talking earlier about how you almost figure this out. It, some people want to know how this all works out of curiosity, but it's like one of those things that you will figure out your rhythm. And this all sounds very abstract where we're talking about this and people are like, tell me exactly. And it's like, I almost can't, you know, and I will draw a parallel to my cheese because that's the current thing I'm learning. Cause I'm always, I'm always learning something new in my home and my homestead because yep. I enjoy that. I enjoy always moving on to the next challenge and figuring things out. But I was watching all of these cheese videos trying to figure out, you know, okay, what supplies do I even need? And my my friend Kate from Venison for Dinner, she was showing how you can make your own cheese press. And I'm like, I'm not even at the point right now where I understand exactly what thing needs to press what. Like, I'm not even there. Right. And you almost just have to just start doing it and be like experiencing it along the way to even understand what's supposed to press what. And so us explaining, okay, it works like this, it works like this, and this challenge can be this. This is all encouraging, but also there's a certain level of you're just going to have to dive in yep. before you're, this is even going to make sense. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I did, you know, there. it is helpful to have a guide to kind of help you jump in and get started. And so I did write a little handbook on how to simplify your school days. Um, it was my first effort at making an ebook type thing. And I have that on my website that people can download for free. And it, it shows a an example of what does a typical day look like? Of course, no two days are the same, especially when you have a lot of kids and a homestead. But it just kind of shows a typical day in our home and talks about just the system that I've developed for myself of how to break down learning while living at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that that's available if anybody's interested in it. Yeah. And that's such a helpful resource because that is it. Life, it just keeps going on. I think that's the challenge Whenever you go from, say, no kids to having kids or public school to then bringing them home. And before these were very separate. And so then figuring out how to do them at the same time, which they actually really build off each other. And it actually makes it to where one happens almost yes. because of the other, not in spite of. But I think at first that that's a challenge that's hard for people to wrap their brains around. So that sounds like a good resource that we will link in the show notes in the description box. I want to take a break from this episode to tell you about one of our awesome sponsors, Toops & Co. That's T-O-U-P-S and Co. I've had a few questions about that lately. Like, what are you saying again? All of the sponsors will be linked down in the show notes as well as on simplefarmhouselifepodcast.com. But Toops & Co. is an organic skincare company that I couldn't speak more highly of. I actually just did my makeup because I like to do my makeup before I come out and record, no matter what kind of day it's been. I have the Tubes & Co. foundation, the mascara. I'm trying to remember what else I have. I have several of their things and I absolutely love it. It's really hard to find a foundation especially that is both quality and good for you. I've struggled with that for years. I even dabbled in making my own for a while. It was really greasy, sort of worked out, but definitely did not have the quality of Tubes & Co. where I actually feel like I'm wearing a foundation. I also really love their skincare products. So I love their cleansing oil. They have this tallow balm that, especially in the winter, I'm starting to not need it as much. I would go to my little tallow balm container five times a day. I just left it out on my bathroom where I pass by often and put it on my face all throughout the day. Now that it's not as dry because we're not running the wood stove, I'm able to do it like once a day and I'm totally fine. But such a luxurious balm that moisturizes the face, but then it also has all natural and organic ingredients, which is really hard to find quality and something that works. Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a 10% off discount by using the code FARMHOUSE. So head over to tubesandco.com, use the code FARMHOUSE to save 10%. I know that you're going to absolutely love their products. A little goes a long way. I haven't had to replace them for a while. I'm almost ready to replace the foundation. And I do a different shade from winter to summer. So I'm in that transition phase of like, I almost need a slight shade darker, which is a good time to get a new foundation. But I know that you are going to absolutely love it. Again, tubesandco.com, use the code farmhouse. 
Okay, I have some audience questions. We've already kind of touched on some of them, but one of them I want to hear your take on is how do you handle the instruction parts of schooling when multiple kids can't read? So we were recently in this and I feel like these children are now both reading pretty well. Finally, Yay. but I had two <laughs> kids that needed to learn to read because they both, one was pretty late in picking it up. And then the other one was just at the age where he needed to start working on it. And so we had two kids who both needed to read, who both really couldn't read. That That is a challenge. That's all I know is I can't really say anything except for we're on the other side of it. They do read <laughs> eventually. Yeah, that's that's awesome. It is a it is a juggling act often, especially when you throw toddlers and babies into the mix because you know you never know what you're going to get there. The biggest suggestion I have is to make sure that you're keeping any type of lessons really short. Um, kids, mm -hmm. their brains just at that age they cannot really intensely handle more than 15 minutes of a certain subject at a time, or they just kind of turn off their brain. Mm -hmm. So you can spare 15 minutes to sit down with a child and do reading practice. I I was able to go to a talk of uh, Susan Wise Bauer a few years ago, and she really encouraged me in this because she said, you know, it's the whole analogy of how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So she said the power of the 15 minutes, 15 minutes a day over an extended period of time can bring incredible results in your children or in anybody. But especially when we have a late reader, because I have had a few late readers myself, and it can mm -hmm. be very unnerving for a mom. Especially um, my oldest, she's let me tell her story, but she was a very late reader and it's your first kid. So you just think, well, you know, what am I doing wrong right, that I wasn't right. able to teach mm -hmm. reading? Well, no, it's just that, you know, we are all made uniquely and Some trying to – so much different, yeah. <laughs> expecting that every kid is going to learn to read about the same time is really unreasonable. I mean, we're just different. And mm -hmm. so it was during that time yeah. that I heard this talk and I thought, I don't need to be anxious about this. We'll just keep working on it 15 minutes a day. And, you know, long story short, she now is a great reader. And the thing that really right. um, turned her over, I think, was her passion for understanding animals and um, homesteading and getting these books that were written for adults and right. figuring out how to really read them. So a lot of a lot of it, I think, is the kid having that want to. But, you know, if you – I'm – let me think about this. I'm at the place now where I have teens, very helpful teens, and younger kids. So things are mm -hmm. a lot easier for me because you, you're not there by yourself with a bunch of small children who can't read, who are still learning how to follow directions, who aren't very helpful. That's an overwhelming season of life. But right. once you move through that, then you get older kids who actually – enjoy when you homeschool and you're all together, they'll enjoy having some time once in a while where they come alongside a younger kid and help them. So that's mm -hmm. the season I'm in now. But whenever I was in that younger, all younger children age, you know, don't put too many expectations on yourself or your children. School at that time, 30 minutes. Shoot for 30 minutes sitting down at the table and then play a whole lot. I mean, that's all a kindergartner needs. They don't... Right need a long period of time. And so maybe it comes during a baby's nap time. You know, you don't have to have school at the mor in the morning time. Right, yeah. Um, use snacks. Snacks are great. Stick the baby in the high chair with snacks and really focus on one kid at a time. Let one play with Play-Doh while you work with the other one and then switch. If you're keeping things short, then it's more manageable than if you feel like I need to have this long extended school day with these beginning reading children. Yeah, I think the... The key with what you just said is, it, again, it's the expectations that we put on ourselves because we know that they're all going to learn to read. It's not like they're going to be adults and not read, no matter how late they read. Here you are, you have 10 kids and, you know, the, there are kids yep, who can read, read. <laughs> and they're... Yep. It's not like you had more time in your day ever. So even with these small amounts of time they do eventually learn to read. And I, I have that too, especially right now, because we had some challenges with that. And then now we're at this point where these kids can read. It's like, okay, would I have cared at all about this, you know, a year ago, if I knew that they'd be reading by next year? Right. No. And you know, they're going to, who's, 
Who's not? Yeah. Everybody who's late on something, you know, assuming that their development, like everything's like, you know, all normal with everything, they're going to eventually learn to read. So <laughs> it's yeah. just the pressure. Yes. And, you know, I think that because we have schools that teach our children to read and teach them, you know, other things, we feel like this is the professional who's able to do this. And am I good enough to do this? Am I good enough to be a professional? But I just imagine if we put our babies in a walking school and we it was a how to learn how to walk school. Well, it would probably only be a generation yeah. <laughs> or two before we started to believe that children wouldn't yeah. be able to learn how to walk if a school. professional wasn't teaching them how. When the reality is that kids, they can't help themselves. They just want to learn. Right. And if we stay out of the way enough, if we just kind of gently support them, then they are going to do it just because that's just how kids are made. It's only it when is. when they've been, you know, that that instinct to learn has been dulled down by circumstances that you run into a problem. But kids just left to their own devices, they, they're they excited to learn. So it, the question then is, when is the best window of opportunity to help this child? And so that's kind of what I watch for with reading. It's not an age, it's a readiness. And if I can see my kids kind of really being interested in the written word, then I say, okay, maybe it's time. You know, we just use an old... Uh, I think it's teach your child to read in a hundred easy oh, lessons. Yeah. There's so many awesome I've seen reading way too much of that but I've done this book. one over and over. So <laughs> <laughs> I've done it over and over. So I just keep yeah. doing it. And it's more of like my I own, um, I don't want to learn something new. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, so, you know, when they're kind of interested, then I haul the book out again and I, but I keep feeling it out with them. I'm not locked in. If we go, you know, 15 lessons in and I can see that whew, this is just not working then I just put it back on the shelf and I'll wait three months yeah. and then feel it out again. I mean, it's just being a student of your child is the key. And that's where you have your success. You you run into problems when you are wanting to mold your child into what you want them to be. When you are trying to say, now is the time to learn this and we're going to learn it no matter what, even if we're both crying at the table together. Yeah, um, right. You know, it's possible to do it that way, but is it necessary if you could reach the same end with a different means? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I, I take the same approach with potty training. Yeah, <laughs> The other exactly. day, Johanna was like... Can we, can we train Theo this summer? And I was like, no. And you know why? <laughs> because I remember well potty training Ruth, Johanna, and Eli. I don't remember the others, the other three, four, what? Okay. The other three that are all potty trained. I don't even remember it. And they were, they were more, more recent. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Because it was significant trauma yep. to try to chain a child under the age of two, how to use the restroom. Yeah, that wasn't ready. <laughs> No, it's just, and the others, they're all fine. They're, like they're, you know, they're three, five, and seven. They're all potty trained. Yeah. I don't even remember doing it. So I'm like, yeah, that's, it's, right. you, you end up in the that's exact great same analogy. place. Yeah. You don't end up any better off. Right. right. With a lot less pain. With, with like zero pain. I don't even remember. I don't even know what I did. I couldn't even tell you. There wasn't little potty chairs. There wasn't chocolate snacks and rewards. There was literally just, I think at <laughs> some point, I put yep. undies on the kid. And my youngest that's potty trained is three. So you know that it's not like they're super old. But still, just at some point, it's right, just right. not that hard. And six months before that, it's extremely hard. Like to the point where it's still burned and, you know, seared yes. in my memory, potty training the first three kids because of that, like, pressure yep. of we have to do this right now nobody remembers that now do oh, i have people yeah, who are like here, friend oh go lisa yep. she really did a great thing potty training that kid before too like they're just remembering it it's in the history books right. no it's not <laughs> and when your yeah. kid goes and is an adult getting a job are they going to say what age did you learn how to read no it's completely irrelevant yeah. no one will yep. ever quiz them on that they will just be an adult who can. Yeah. And so, again, it's just all of these things that take the pressure off of mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is that is where you have the freedom and the mental wherewithal to actually create this type of home where, you know, you're, you're teaching to love to learn. Which brings me to another question. Someone says, what is your best piece of advice for instilling a love of learning mindset throughout your home? I think it really just comes back to mom's attitude. 
um, again, you know, being that lead learner, Mm -hmm. modeling that if you're learning something, you're excited about it, that it's a good thing. You're not afraid to try something new and also being interested in what they're interested in. So, you know, I have conversations with my kids, especially as they're getting older and they are so excited to share something with me. And, you know, I would honestly say that I'm struggling to pay attention because it's not interesting to me, but they are really right. excited. <laughs> and so I yeah. put myself in the position of being excited with them. It's a choice to listen to the things that they're learning and passionate about. And it's fueling that enthusiasm that they have naturally in them. Again, kids are born with this enthusiasm. That's how they manage to learn to walk, even though they fall down and hurt themselves over and over. Um, it's just that that determination. I want to learn this. That same quality is in every child and it can carry through if you continue to encourage it. So uh, being really excited along with them, even if it's not your thing, not correcting them when they're learning something new. Um, that has been a big one for me. So my kids, they decided to start learning musical instruments. They actually used Votberg. I know you know the, the Votbergs. Oh, okay, um, they yeah. used their um, online mm-hmm. course. And when they first started, I I knew music. So I um, played multiple instruments growing up. I had a band with my sisters. Music was really important to me. So I had a lot of musical knowledge. Well, here they are starting out learning because they're excited and interested in it. Mm -hmm. I never reminded them to practice. It was all on them. I could see them making big mistakes. And because they were new and learning and excited, I didn't try to correct everything because what it does is just kind of puts a damper on it and it makes it mm-hmm. less exciting for them as they have matured which they've they've grown so quickly in their knowledge it's really really amazing they are figuring out the oh wait i that's not how that goes i made a mistake there i need to do that differently they're figuring it out on their own which then fuels them with more confidence to keep trying because they aren't waiting for me to be like, well, you didn't do that right. right. And you didn't do that right. And you need to practice because you didn't practice today. And you know that, that negative attitude that I could put on them, when I just bite my tongue and stand back and let them learn on their own, um, it's giving them courage. It's making them brave to keep trying new things. And you know what? If they decide, I hate this, I don't want to ever play the guitar again, then that would be okay too. I'm not going to stand there and be like, well, we purchased blah, blah, blah. And you know, you better keep up with that hobby because I put out mm-hmm. money and time on this. You know, I could do that. But how is that helping them to, during this time of discovery, to figure out who am I? What does my future look like? What are the things that I'm passionate about? I mean, that's, yeah. that's my bottom line goal in raising these kids. And then learning that I like this family culture of learning that it's okay to try new things. We are the type of family that tries new things, learn new things. We're excited about constantly growing in that area. There is that family culture that comes about when the parents, like you said, are also that way. And so that definitely helps. And then always giving them the resources, like providing them with you know, instruments, whether they're from Facebook Marketplace or whatever. And, you know, the online course you did for them to learn music, learning how to help them figure out how is also really important, which sometimes, you know, like I know nothing about music. My kid, I have two children who play music. I wouldn't say that it's a, (laughs) it's not that they, they don't love it or that they don't like it. They just, I don't think that it's their gifting necessarily. They keep going, like they're doing music competitions and stuff like that, but still providing them if they're interested in some of the things that they need to get started, even if it's something that you might not really know much about, you know, you don't have to, to teach them. They can learn. One thing that has been very helpful for me in my from scratch kitchen is a grain mill. Recently, actually probably a year ago now, I upgraded to the mock mill because of its beautiful design. It has this wood finish. It's very thin. It doesn't have a bowl with it. So you can take any bowl that's laying around your house, depending on how much flour you want to make. So it's not this bulky thing always sitting there. And I absolutely love it. It makes it to where I have it always accessible. I can grab some whole grains, throw it in really fast while I'm busy in the kitchen, which is what has always stopped me from milling grains very often before. I've been experimenting with kamut, einkorn, spelt, rye, 
I like to do my basic no need sourdough recipe and then throw in about a fourth of the flour in some other grain. It doesn't alter the recipe very much. It makes it to where it's still very palatable. It's fluffy and delicious, but then we also have that added whole grain. Sourdough starters are also very happy being fed with whole grain flours. And so having a mill is just a very nice addition to a from scratch or a homestead kitchen. Mock Mill is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a 5% off discount using my link bit.ly forward slash farmhouse mock mill. Again, that's bit.ly forward slash farmhouse mock mill, all lowercase. I've had some people say that they didn't see the discount applied. It will be once you go through the entire checkout process. There's no coupon code required. Once you get to the final stages of checkout, you will see that there is that 5% applied. Again, I couldn't recommend the mock mill more. Head to bit.ly forward slash farmhouse mock mill. It'll also be linked down in the show notes or description box. Okay, I have a few more uh, random question. So one is how many outside of the home activities do you do? We, we used to do quite a few. And then in 2020, you know, everything kind of shut down temporarily and it gave us an opportunity to reassess and say, why are we doing this much? It was, it was good. And so right now we actually are not in any outside activities. We have become kind of a, a hub of activity right here at our house. We have a lot of people come over just this week, actually, the past like three days. We've had two different big families come through um, from other parts of the country. So we've kind of made ourselves the activity, I suppose, at this time in our life. Yeah. I can see how whenever they're a little bit younger, it's really important to maybe make you not feel as alone, to meet some other people who make you feel more normal. But then as your family has grown, being the host, that's a great idea. Yes, yes. Um, okay. What toys slash shows are approved in your household? What is your style compared to the trendy Montessori ones? Mm. You know, it's so funny about this question. When I was a teenager, I thought I wanted to be a Montessori teacher. That was my goal in life. Oh, so. okay. It's kind of funny. Anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> so... We are definitely, I would say, on the stricter side of what we allow in. We actually don't have a TV, although our kids watch plenty of shows. It's just we have, you know, the laptops and things. But being in a small house, a, a TV was like a space luxury that I wasn't willing to oh, give yeah. up. But it's been a good thing because instead of just kind of being a victim to whatever's on TV in front of you, it's put you in the position of making the choice. I'm choosing whatever it may be, to watch. And I definitely, you know, we let our kids watch movies and shows and things, but I overall want to have things that encourage them to have good character. I'm not really interested in things that show, you know, teens with really bad attitudes or disrespect, right, yeah. like those kind of things. I just don't want in my house. I don't think kids need any help <laughs> with um, as they're learning how to navigate relationships as they grow up. So toys. Let's see. We keep it basic because we live in a small house. So it's things that right. are creative like Legos and blocks, of course. Yeah. Um, my kids each have their own personal things. But for the most part, um, actually, my daughter, she was been listening to it was probably one of your podcasts, Lisa, on minimalism. <laughs> and so she's oh, yeah. constantly <laughs> encouraging me. Do we really need this, mom? I don't think so. Let's get rid of this. And so she's helped me continue to simplify awesome. more and more. I feel like I have less toys now that I have more children than I did when I had, you know, yeah, less kids. But. I do. Yeah. When we when Ruth was little, we had a whole room full of toys. And now we don't even have that many toys for all of the kids. Yep. Cause yeah, it's just way too much to manage. And I think over time, you find out that kids, you know, those initial excitement toys that they might get on their birthday that they're like, wow, this is so amazing. It loses its interest so quickly. Oh, so Whereas fast. the more open-ended toys are the ones that they actually will continue to play with. So to me, you know, coming from a standpoint of, um, you know, just space, that's just really my biggest yeah. thing that I use to judge everything right now. It's like, is this worth having around? I probably not. Probably right. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's how we evaluate it too. Art supplies. Lots of art supplies. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's always 
that's always good for certain kids. My kids turn stuff into art supplies that shouldn't be art supplies. We, we don't even need art supplies because uh -huh. <laughs> sew together like little pieces of paper and stuff. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> okay, I do have one more question just because it was a good one. How do you know when it's just a hard season versus when things are not working? And the reason I think that's a good one is because there is definitely this tendency in our culture to always have some kind of solution for everything whenever some things are just hard and maybe there just really isn't any way except for just showing up and doing things that are rough every single day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I definitely will have those days where I just don't feel like doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my quick solution for days like that is get up and do something that you'll be glad that you did, you know, like wash some dishes or something. I mean, you'll be glad you did it and sometimes it helps, but overall, um, when it comes to those kind of seasons, um, this is where there is an advantage to walking with the Lord because, uh, you know, God can reveal things to you. And so, you know, he can, he can make it clear, talk to your spouse, pray about it, talk to your kids, the people around you, but just trust that the Lord is going to show you, okay, something needs to change. And here's what it is. Don't be too quick to feel like you need to jump into a change. Give yourself some space. You know, like I said earlier, maybe take some time off of what you're doing every day to reassess things. I do probably two or three times a year. I'll just kind of sit down and I'll say, what, you know, what is the natural flow of our days right now? What do I like and what do I not like? And is there something that I need to change? Is there something that I like so much that I want to keep it? It's just a time of self-reflection that's important because there we do need to stick through some things. Sometimes you are in a hard season that all you can do is just, you know, pull yourself up and keep going. But we want to enjoy our lives. I mean, this is our life. This is our kid's life. We want it to be something that is enjoyable. And so if there's something that is really preventing that from happening and it's not a crucial, necessary thing, then mm -hmm. remove it from your life. Yeah, that's a really that's a really good answer. Sometimes it's hard to do. For us, it's definitely some activities that we're doing. We're in this, I feel like it's been like a year now where there's probably since the beginning of the school school year or just whenever everybody else does school year, there's something every single night, literally every night, except Fridays. Oh, Lisa, that's hard. I know. Well, in a lot, some of it's going to end whenever school ends. We're in two different Awanas groups, <laughs> which I don't know how we got ourselves into that situation. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, there's just, there's baseball. There's, there's just something every night of the week. And I never wanted to do that. Which it's okay. It's not overly stressful. It's just that there's never these open ended evenings where, you know, you're just like, well, what are we going to do tonight? You know, that's not, that's not a thing. Yeah. I think so. that it's really important to have that big family vision picture. You know, what, what is our family vision mm -hmm. as we raise our kids? And does this fit in that? And if it doesn't, then maybe it just needs to go. Right. Yeah. I know. When it, it, when some of the stuff ends at the end of the school year, I might consider like reconsider whether we sign back up for them next year. Cause I'm like, oh, we don't need mm -hmm. something going on yeah, every night. For that. You know, that's just way too much. Right. No, that sounds overwhelming. I yeah. Feel for you. <laughs> I know it is. It is. And that's just, that's not even like, we're not in all of these sports. There's just something, you know, every night. So, well, because you have more than a few kids, if each kid does one thing that yeah. adds up really fast. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. All right. Well, let us know where to follow up with you. You mentioned your homeschool website. Delight. What was it again? Delightfulhomeschool.com? Yes. The Delightfulhomeschool.com. And that's where you can find that free ebook that I wrote and um, just a lot of encouragement. I just want it to be a place of encouragement for homeschooling moms in particular. That just seems to be my biggest um, community. Uh, you can also find us. Our YouTube channel is Jason and Julie, and I'm on Instagram too. So you can find us there. That's where I just share a little, you know, daily glimpses of life right. in the Crakey house. Cool. Awesome. We'll also leave all of that down in the show notes and in the description box if you're watching on YouTube. So thanks again so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Lisa. This was fun. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Make sure to go check out Julie's resources to help you in your homeschooling journey. And I will see you in the next episode.